something a little different. Um, this is a public talk. Uh, Burlington is a very small community full of wonderful people, and Rosetta Commons is also a small community full of wonderful people, and I thought it'd be great to see if we could um, mix the two communities up, introduce them a little bit, and uh, so I asked Rebecca to give this talk because I thought she's a, she's a great representative for the community. I mean, everyone's a great representative, but um, so Rebecca, as many of you know, she's a, um, she started coding in Rosetta as a high school student in Rich Bonneau's lab at New York <coughs> University. Um, and then now she's an undergrad and has uh, studied Tom Ken over at, at Carnegie Mellon and has been working at doing research in, in Jeff Gray's lab over at Johns Hopkins. And she's uh, research she's done in high school and also as an undergrad has been published. Um, and so she's going to talk to us today about uh, that research and also her experience in the Rosetta Commons. Rebecca. Thank you, Javier, for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about um, what is really sort of the continuation from my experience in high school to my experience in college, uh, being someone who's trying to use Rosetta, which is a software suite to understand more about protein structure, to understand this biological problem, meaning what happens when we have diseases, what happens underneath the surface. Um, and I hope that I can try to give a perspective both of scientific and also some of these, um, not only what it might be like to be in the community, but some of the really present issues that we're considering in not just the science, but the people that are doing the science. So I actually got into science when I was relatively young because I was diagnosed with a really rare genetic disorder that impairs my vision. It makes it really difficult to see color, contrast, and anything that's maybe smaller detailed. Um, but instead of sort of being stopped by the limitations that this might have imposed, I was really interested in understanding how things worked. That was just sort of my natural intuition. Um, and the main question that really got me into this was understanding if I have an image that I can look at, um, what is the process that allows me to interpret that image with my eye and my brain into something that's a thing or to something that's interpretable? And it turns out that this is a really, there's a really complex and not very well understood answer to this question. Um, this is a really, relatively simplified representation, but not just for vision, but in your body there are lots of cells and they have lots of responsibilities and they all talk to each other by passing messages or passing materials to get the job done. And um, what's sort of inherent in, in a very complicated system is that it's not necessarily super robust to failure. If you have a single point that fails, maybe a cell that's not working as well, the message isn't passed as efficiently as it, as it could have been. So one of the ways that um, we've really started to unpack these really complicated systems is we've, is we've really gone to the basics of biology, or the basics of understanding how we are who we are, which is understanding the relationship between how DNA encodes for a sequence and how that sequence translates into some protein with a, which has a specific function and how that protein leads to a z disease. And then if there's an error, how that might affect the function. So the last, to be totally honest, the last time I talked about this in a very big picture was um, in 2013 when I was a freshman at Carnegie Mellon, um, almost four years ago on TEDx 2013. Um, and where I had gotten at this point in my career was um, at the Bonneau Lab, we had built the software which basically allows you to say, if I have a mutation, can I mine a lot of biological data to predict what would happen? Um, but what I want to talk to you today uh, is the fact that this is really much more complex than I think I had originally made it out or originally envisioned the problem. Um, there are lots of sequences. I think if you stretch out all of your DNA, it spans about three miles. Um, I might not have that number perfect. Um, there are lots of single molecules that in your body that have functions, and there are an estimated 650,000 protein-protein interactions. So this approach of let me take a single sequence and figure out what happens to a single protein in a cell might not necessarily be as efficient as digest a lot of this information and unfortunately if you start to think about what would happen if you assigned every single protein, every single person, a mutation to investigate or a protein to investigate, this would take a really long time and it would cost a lot of money and there are way too many diseases at stake and problems to interpret to um, sort of take that approach. So this is where computation has a tremendous amount of promise to help us solve these problems. So today what I'm going to talk to you about is um, first I think bringing people into computation. Um, I think in order to do this combined biology computer science thing, we really need people who um, understand the value of it and can come in with the skill sets to solve the problems. 
I'm gonna then I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the science that I've been doing to try to marry these together within the Rosetta Commons, which has been really a fantastic community to do that, and then some of the things that I envision for the future. So just to start with this, this idea of people. So my first interaction with like other scientists, maybe in the Vanilla Lab or in the Rosetta Commons, was my first Rosetta Con. Um, and I was about 18 years old, so I, I maybe didn't have as broad of a worldview as I might have now, but the one thing that I think as I got older started to recognize was that I was usually the only girl in the room. Um, that's gotten a lot better now. If you look around, you can see that um, things, things look a little bit brighter than, what, than they once did. Um, and at first you can say, well, I just want to take people as people. I don't really care you know, what, what labels you assign to them, but then you realize that you really want to have people from a lot of different perspectives contributing to really difficult problems. Um, and I'm not the only one that's recognized this. Um, a lot of really important government organizations spend a lot of time collecting statistics. And what we know is that um, when you start in high school, there's already a gender gap. Um, only about one in four high schools actually offer computer science. So that means that you might have to seek out other avenues to even acquire those skills of an interest. And as you move to, down the pipeline to university or postgraduate opportunities, um, there are less and less and less um, women that you see in, in computational fields. And this is definitely reflected in our community. So it doesn't mean that it's necessarily you know, Rosetta or computer sciences or, or any particular field's fault. Well, it's just really consistent. Um, but over time, if you look at the attendance of women and meetings at the summer and the winter meeting, you see that there's a really consistent gender gap. So um, I'm going to present this in kind of science project style, because that's what I'm used to. Uh, so the first thing that we did, or I think the first formal thing that we did was in 2014, we wanted to really investigate the problem. So along with my mentor, Jeff Gray, we brought the first team of Rosetta students to the Grace Hopper Celebration uh, for Women in Computing. And the purpose of this conference is not to like walk around and be really bitter about all the problems. It's to celebrate all the achievements of the people and provide opportunities for women to get internships and jobs and all these different opportunities in computer science and meet other women who are doing this. Um, when we brought the Rosetta team, uh, one of our goals was to actually recruit more students into Rosetta to get to get them excited about the problems that we were solving. Uh, but I think for me, my, my main goal was to sort of stake out like what are what are other people doing in other organizations or in other companies to in increase diversity in their communities. Um, and basically what we figured out was Grace Hopper sort of embodies exactly what the solution is. You just need to create more opportunities for people to get involved. Um, Grace Hopper does that because they have a huge career fair that's really just directed at giving people opportunities. So um, I thought, you know, both within the commons and outside, why can't we do the same? So the first channel, um, this is a kind of Rosetta, kind of not Rosetta channel, um, but at Carnegie Mellon, we host something called Tech Nights. It's a weekly program where we bring girls up for, who are uh, of middle school age, so like fifth to eighth grade from the middle school area, uh, from the Pittsburgh area, um, and we, you know, we design these activities to get them excited about computer science. Uh, these are some pictures of the protein folding one that I did. Um, I thought that I would extend it by like, instead of just doing fold it, which is basically this game, if you haven't heard of it before, it's this game way of like looking, uh, solving protein folding problems. We gave them pipe cleaners instead of a good builder on, so I think these are pictures of what they did. <laughs> um, and uh, this was also a fun opportunity because this also serves um, the Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, so it's not necessarily just women, but people who have different types of abilities and perspectives to get them excited about computer science. Except uh, a friend and I found that there was uh, Anna Studio, she's pictured up there, and Dr. Calfreeze is the one who supported this project. Um, there's a really big problem with this program. It's, it's not that it's a bad thing, but it's really just designed to get girls excited about computer science. But if they, and it's good because it happens right before high school where you might have an opportunity to like, take a CS elective, but the problem is it doesn't actually equip you with any skills so that you'd be really well suited off when you when you actually get to those electives. And this is a maybe very qualitatively documented problem that girls get into CS classes and they feel like they're not ready or they're not as well equipped as their um, their peers. So what we, and, and we we did like a, a really broad literature analysis of like what curriculums were out there, both classroom based and outreach, and we, we pretty much found this consistent gap. So what we did was we designed um, a completely new curriculum for Tech Nights where everything still preserved the motivation-based, uh, you know, let's get excited about computer science, here are all the problems that you can solve with it. But, it's, but what was addition to that was everything was skill-building based. 
Uh, so this is an example of a lesson that we actually tested. Um, the idea was that girls would write their own algorithms to generate art. There's a package called Turtle that's Python based. Um, and basically we taught them these statements and they typed them in and they generated these pictures and they really loved it. They were engaged for like the entire hour and a half. Um, and maybe we didn't collect such quantitative data for this session because we were still figuring things out, but it was really promising that you could like teach girls to write, like middle school age girls to write Python in like an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that was really cool. Um, the next thing that I got involved with was actually within my own high school. Uh, this is the lab that I, behind there that I started in. Um, and when I started doing computation, uh, none of the teachers knew what computational biology was. Um, which is almost ironic, because um, I was really fortunate to go to a high school that supports doing research at a young age. Um, but computation is almost like some, some of the easiest projects to do, because they don't have to buy materials. And they don't need to worry about like hazards and, and writing things up for, for kids under, under age. Um, so really, we just had to convince the admins in the school to like install Python, install PyML, and install PyRosetta, which is a, a Python-based interface to Rosetta. Um, and these are the these are the team that I'm measuring right now with a, a very staged picture of uh, Primal. <laughs> but um, they they've really loved uh, doing these kinds of projects. It it really allows them to explore science at a different level. And what's also cool about computation is like you really expand the problems that you, the the kinds of projects that these kids can do. Um, all of these teams they came to me and said, "Oh, this is a question I'm really excited about." We were able to design a project around it. That was based on what they were they were interested in, and I think that that's I think it's done in some ways, but I think it's a really cool way to get get people into computer science instead of just saying here's the class, learn all the basics. You say okay, let's take something that you want to do and show you how you can use these skills to solve that problem or get excited about it. And then the last sort of diversity related piece I'll talk about is something really recent, which is the Rosetta internship program that we started last summer. Um, so Jeff Gray, who really pioneered a lot of this, um, we were able to get some startup NSF funding so that we could actually support undergraduates to do summer internships in Rosetta. Um, so last summer we had eight interns, and instead of just bringing them straight into the lab, what we did was uh, Andrew and myself taught a week-long, uh, basically, course where we taught them, like, these are the basics and these are how you maybe start getting to use the software, um, really sort of lowering the barrier um, so that their, their 10 remaining weeks of research was a lot more exciting and a lot more lucrative. And I think um, when we got to the poster session at the end of the summer, that was really telling. So these are just some examples of uh, ways that myself or like a, lo a lot of really collaborative efforts have tried to get um, more people into computer science. Because as I sort of began, um, solving these problems is they're very complex, and they're going to involve a lot of people, and they're going to involve a lot of effort. So we really want to bring all the ideas, and all the tools, and all the resources we can to throw and solve, to throw at them and solve them. Um, and for the second part of my talk, what I'd really like to do is talk about um, the science that I've gotten excited about over the past couple of years, um, and, and sort of maybe at the end show you how those things can tie together. So I started this talk by talking about this the cellular network. Uh, cells that talk to each other and they perform jobs and um, you sort of need the whole network working to, to get function out or, or working pretty well. So the kind of proteins that I've been really interested or interested in over the past couple of years have been membrane proteins. These are proteins that typically reside on the, the boundaries of these cells, um, sort of acting as an interface to the uh, extracellular world um, and also as, as parts of organelles which are things that do work within the cell. Um, and membrane proteins perform a lot of tasks. They transport materials in and out of the cell, they send signals, they catalyze chemical reactions, um, and what's remarkable is they constitute about a third of all the proteins in your body. And right now, I think that number is low. They're almost, they account for almost 60% of the drugs on the market or their, their targets for them. So there are things um, that I think if we, if we had some structural information, we could really do a lot with it. Um, but unfortunately, because of the, the chemical nature of membrane proteins, which I'll talk about in a second, um, they're really underrepresented in our structural knowledge. So if you can see on the left-hand side, this is a log scale. So this gap would actually be really big if I, if I plotted the numbers. Um, but right now, alpha helical proteins are, are slightly above beta virals just because a certain class of uh, alpha, like basically helical membrane proteins are GPCRs, and those have been really well studied by crystallography. 
Um, but really, the, you know, we've just reached above 1,000 in the PDB, whereas we have you know, almost 100,000 soluble protein structures. So certainly, like, there's a lot of work to do on that. Um, and the main reason that this is really difficult is because um, when we go to apply a lot of the methods that we've developed for soluble proteins to understanding membrane protein structure, we run into this barrier because there's this basic difference in biochemistry. Soluble proteins in solution, they have a lot of polar or water liking residues that face the, the water or that face outside. Um, whereas membrane proteins, because they're facing the polar lipids, um, now you have to express them, reconstitute them into the right membrane. Um, and then because we've, we've sort of developed all these workarounds, um, like these proteins aggregate, and then they're not in membranes that are similar to the ones in your cell. Um, because it turns out that there are lots of different lipid types instead of just one in the experimental system versus the, the cellular system. So because this is so difficult and because we're really lagging behind in our structural knowledge, this is a place where we'd be really excited to use computation and specifically really excited to, to use Rosetta. So Rosetta is the software that's been developed like far, far before I, I ever got here by a lot of people who are much more talented than I am. Um, to really solve, to really ask a lot of interesting questions about biological systems. Uh, some of the things that have been done, um, and by the way, these are all contribute, pictures contributed by people in this room, um, uh, investing in like hands on proteins, uh, how proteins bind to solid surfaces, designing new proteins with interesting functions, um, how do small molecules bind to proteins, uh, how do, what, looking at antibody structure, enzyme structure, um, and as a product of all these questions, we have this really large library of tools that we can just use to, to sample basic structures. Um, so, so the basics of how, how Rosetta works, just going over, like for those who aren't familiar in the room, um, so essentially what we do is a, a Monte Carlo algorithm. And essentially the way this works is we sample different conformations of the protein by making different moves. So some of the moves started with names like shake or rattle or um, pull, up, pull things apart. Um, and then we use a score function to evaluate like would that structure actually occur in nature. Um, and a low Rosetta score would correspond to something that, that we would probably call a reasonable structure. Um, so essentially what the goal became, at least um, along with Julia Kohler Lehman, who works in the Gray Lab, is to transform all of these Rosetta tools into something where we can ask these questions in the membrane. Um, and essentially what that boils down to is um, first, thinking about what does it mean when your, your structure is actually in the membrane? Um, and the, question, the relevant question that you have to ask is, what is its orientation? Is it out of the membrane? Is it, is it partially out? Like that, that, it turns out that that really matters a lot for the function. And then the other thing that you have to ask is, how does the chemistry change when you, when you add a membrane there? Like yes, it's hydrophobic, but really it's, it's a little bit more complex than that because there are lots of different membranes, they have lots of different chemistry, and all of those are really important for the function. So if we can get Rosetta to handle those two types of questions, then maybe we could get a little bit cl closer to sort of transforming all of those exciting things to also do that with memory proteins. So um, now I'm just going to talk about the, the progress that we've made so far. Um, a lot of this has been on the sampling side. Um, so asking that question, where does the protein sit relative to the memory? Um, this, is, this is a slide basically on, on how we've handled that. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to tell you, and you're going to see this kind of gray box representation throughout the rest of the slide. So membranes, as you saw earlier, they're full of lots of lipids, which are have lots of atoms to them, um, and they're they're relatively complex. So one of the things that we do in Rosetta to simplify the problem is we just say that um, for a specific region around the protein, everything is hydrophobic, and that's that's what that gray box is representing. And it, for for a starting point, it's an okay approximation to. Um, so the first thing we ask is, where is the protein relative to the membrane? Um, we say the membrane is a certain thickness, it's a certain center in the coordinate system, and it's at a certain orientation. And then the other thing we uh, provide to Rosetta is what regions of that protein actually span the membrane and what, what regions are, solution, are in solution. So you can see here these red and blue would be outside, and the green is inside. And that's just some data that we associate with um, sampling moves so that we can we can do it a little bit smarter and a little bit more memory aware. So what's really exciting about the way Rosetta is built um, is it's extremely modular. So um, meaning that like something that might represent a protein or something that might represent a move is very encapsulated. So if you want to add something new, you just kind of add more building blocks. Um, so that's 
pretty much what we did for membrane proteins. Uh, a pose is, is the way that we traditionally represent um, a protein or a, a biomolecular system in Rosetta. Um, and what we did to, to make membrane proteins work is we just added more of these blocks that said, here's where the membrane is, here's where the transmembrane spans are. Um, and that turns out to be really helpful when you try to go ex extend to ask different kinds of questions. So what are questions that we've asked so far? Some of these are things that we've done with a little bit of depth. Some of these are things that we've done with a lot of depth. Um, the first is, uh, this is actually how we started this project. Um, if you try to like model the interface between two proteins in the membrane, you get this question, how do they actually associate? How does the chemistry change? And then also it turns out that most membrane proteins are over 600 amino acids or their complexes. So this is really relevant for membrane proteins. Um, when we first tried this, um, all of the subunits were out of the membrane and nowhere close to where, where we wanted them to be. So with this framework, we got a lot closer. Um, another thing that we were able to ask is, um, what happens when you have a symmetric and a really large complex? So this was a collaboration with Frank DeMaio, who works on um, incorporating symmetry into Rosetta. Um, we were able to get, this is a, a homo tetramer, so it has four subunits. We were able to model things with up to six, um, which was kind of exciting, because it turns out when you ask questions about symmetry and membrane proteins at the same time, it's, it's harder than you anticipated. Um, another question, which is going into a little bit more detail, is um, when you change the sequence of the protein, which, turn, which propagates to changing the chemical composition, how much does it cost? Like, would I destabilize the entire protein? Would it completely fold out? Um, would I get something new? Because that's really a stepping stone to design, right? We change the sequence, and then we say, can we get a new function out of it? Um, so one of this, this actually started a collaboration between our lab and the Fleming lab at Hopkins. Um, Karen, Fleming, Karen Fleming's lab had measured these delta delta Gs of mutation, which is basically how much does it cost to change, how much energy does it cost to go from one residue to another, um, doing this at the same position in this beta barrel protein at the center of the membrane. And what we get from this is this starting question of, well, how well does Rosetta actually estimate this energy? Um, it's really useful in just a general, like, when I score a membrane protein, does it, does it give me a relevant answer? And it's also a really exciting step in the design to design. So this result where we get like, like a 0.7 correlation was a, a really a cool thing to see. Uh, and then another thing that I did, with, which was actually a little bit earlier, is um, some work in the vanilla lab, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's cool, um, is uh, if, you, if you use the score function and some other structural <coughs> features in Rosetta to scan the entire protein, could you figure out, um, using some big data analytics, which mutations actually result in changes in functions and which ones don't. Um, and then basically the next place that I'm specifically gonna go is, um, I talked about earlier representing the membrane as this, this gray slab, something that's just very general. Um, really bringing that up to something where we can really start asking questions about membrane proteins and selling membranes. So basically changing the representation, but in a not computationally expensive way um, to, to get things in, in native like membranes. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail now, but you're happy to ask me questions about it afterward. And the questions that I talked about are really just a small sampling of maybe what we're necessarily doing in the gray lab, but there's a lot of work you know, throughout the Rosetta Commons where people are asking questions about membrane proteins. That's really exciting and pushing the boundaries. Uh, the left-hand side is a voltage-gated calcium channel, and this is in two states. So one is the inactive state where it's not working, and the second is the active state. Um, and here, Rosetta was used to model those different conformations in combination with some experiments. The center is studying G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, I think I, I started the talk talk discussing those. Uh, these are really important for signaling, so people are really excited about them. Um, so this is a case where Rosetta was used to figure out um, which mutations are important for like ligand binding in, in receptors. And then on the um, on the right hand side is uh, another Rosetta algorithm that's using this membrane protein functionality to ask uh, just can we predict structures if we add some more data into the equation based on from evolution. And it's a really exciting time to be doing stuff with membrane proteins because there's uh, there's this big wave of structures that's hopefully coming from cryo EM. Uh, I started saying that you know membrane proteins are traditionally really difficult to uh, determine, but cryo EM is exciting because it turns out to be relatively better for these larger structures. So this is um, what is uh, an exciting. This is a 3.4 angstrom structure of the transient receptor voltage gated channel or TRPV1. 
Um, and it's important in a lot of like sensory functions. So uh, hearing, touch, taste, and so forth. And this is a really exciting result because now we have this, a picture of this huge structure that we really did beforehand. Um, and another exciting thing is it turns out like, whereas in a lot of these previous experiments, you had to sort of put this, the protein in this like not as native-like environment, here, what you can do is you can actually resolve part of the memory uh, when you do structure determination, which is going to be, um, I think, is exciting and interesting for, for this field. Um, so why am I doing this? Um, so I think that like there are lots of, I think the problem that I talked about today is one of many, um, whereas that has a lot of potential to answer interesting questions. Um, there are lots of applications in materials design, um, just designing proteins to do interesting things, but the one I care about is drug development. Um, if you have a structure, all of a sudden you have this map of maybe how things work on a molecular level that can be much more helpful um, than when you started. So right now, uh, I found it really fun to read these papers. Right now we're still at a constant rate developing about 21 drugs a year. Um, about one in 10 of the drugs that start through phase three to clinical trials actually make it. And we spend about a billion dollars on each, including probably the initial research and development that needs to happen. Um, and if you read through all these papers, one of the largest bottlenecks is really just not understanding how that drug would actually work if you understood all the, the molecular mechanisms and really understood all the biology that's happening on the molecular level. Um, and I think that this is an exciting problem that maybe with some memory protein structures or structures of all other molecules that we can try to answer. So to kind of wrap up, so I talked about two things that might seem really separate, um, getting people into computation and understanding uh, how things work at the molecular level. But I really see them as going together because the people in this room are the ones that are going to ask really interesting questions about how molecules work. Um, and if you don't have them, the science is going to happen. Um, so I really hope that like, as we move forward, we start to approach problems in a, in a more global way and understand um, that if we're really going to transform the science, if we're really going to make transformative moves in these problems, we can bring computation science and great people together to solve really exciting problems. So I just I have a lot of thank yous. Um, all the people who are involved in the diversity stuff, uh, the outreach, especially Anastasia, the intern program, Sally Connor and Andrew. Uh, Sally really supported the NSF program. The, Sally gave us the NSF program to support the interns. Um, and this is the initial Grace Hopper team. There was one that also went this year that um, I know really continued the effort and they also belong on this slide. Um, also Anita Borg who like funded some of the diversity stuff. Um, and then also for the science, uh, everyone in the Gray Lab, uh, some people from the Fleming Lab, who's pictured below, um, who have really been instrumental, especially in um, some of the lipid composition-based stuff that I'm starting to working on. And um, also, thank you to the entire Rosetta Commons. Um, I think it's grown since I started, and the thing that I have to say is that it's an incredible community to innovate in, and for me, it was an incredible community. It has been an incredible community to grow up as an innovator in, and I'm really excited to see what everyone does in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Yeah, I do. Uh, the middle school outreach program was really spectacular. Uh, is it an ongoing thing? Um, yeah, so so uh, Anastasia and I have put it down this year because we're both like figuring out what we're going to do next year. Um, <laughs> but um, it's a, so we have the entire curriculum in like a published, like very long PDF form. Um, and I think one of our summer plans is to consolidate it into a website where people can access the lessons because um, people have expressed interest, so we'd really yeah. like to share it if we can. Themselves, where you have lots of different mixtures of lipid types. Um, so, so that's also a really exciting question, especially since like a lot of problems like high cholesterol is related to having like high concentrations of cholesterol in the membrane itself. So there's a lot of simulation work being done there. 
But I think it, in terms of like my personal direction, I really care about what happens like when you put the protein in that membrane and how, how the function of the structure change is. So uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, fairly high resolution cryo-EM structure of the membrane protein. Uh, and uh, I mean, cryo is becoming a very powerful tool for solving larger complexes, including the membrane proteins. Now, uh, Rosetta's score function is parameterized with crystal structures. Right. And we know that it's got issues with PNMR-derived structures just because there's different assumptions that go into the creation of the structure. Have you looked at how, uh, like where and if, our score functions fail on um, cryo-EM derived structures? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I'm currently doing that I didn't talk about here because it's it's just not far enough along to, to be part of the story yet, um, is doing like really extensive benchmarking on how Rosetta does with memory protein structures, um, both cryo-EM, crystal, and NMR. Um, I'm not far enough along to tell you how poorly it does, but I guess, I guess what I could say is that um, there are a lot of holes and there are a lot of questions to be answered, and I think that like um, the initial work that was done on it was really amazing, given the number of structures that are available, and we can only go up from there. Last question, Chris. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think your your outreach outreach work is very inspiring, um, and it seems like each stage in your career, look back <laughs> to the stage that you excelled in, and then <clears throat> pro provided some amazing outreach opportunities. So now that you're leaving undergrad. Do you have any plans for outreach opportunities for the for other undergraduates? Um, so I definitely, um, so I guess we started doing the intern program last year and I think I've really enjoyed, especially doing the, what, what we call boot camp or the, the introduction to Rosetta week. Um, I think that's been really fun, especially since um, I can really relate, like when I got into Rosetta, there was no boot camp um, and there was, there was no here's how you use things. So I think that like making it easier for people to get into it and making it a really positive experience is something I'm excited to do. And I'm gonna teach that week again this summer. So that's that's the most immediate thing, but long term future is not not certain yet. Great. Let's, uh, thanks Rebecca again and thank you.